Hi, this is Ellie Fishman. Welcome to our new series of talks looking at incidental omas. And it's going to be a practical guide, perhaps, of strategies to prevent us all from not going plain crazy. Incidental omas are very common and can be of no significance or critical significance. And the way you think about incidental omas is an unsuspected finding in an organ or organ system that was not the primary source of the patient's presentation. The key to, with an incidental finding is to determine its significance and whether or not it needs further evaluation. Now we all know that one of the best things about CT is it picks up findings that we were not suspecting. In a patient with renal colic, it picks up a cancer. In a patient with right lower quadrant pain, rule out its appendicitis, it finds ischemic bowel or an aortic aneurysm or renal calculus. Okay, those are all incidental findings and very important. So an incidental finding has this kind of feel to it that, oh, it's not important, it's just bugging me. No, 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 some incidental findings are very critical. The question is which are critical and which are simply just bugging you and which ones are kind of in between. Now, incidental omas are very famous. They even have their own Wikipedia page. And you can see when you look carefully, the differential uh, things that they consider incidental omas, adrenal, renal, pituitary, thyroid, parathyroid, pulmonary nodule, others are things we are gonna discuss today. And if you look back at that slide, in medicine, an incidental oma is a tumor found by coincidence, incidental, without clinical symptoms or suspicion. It is a common problem. Up to 7% of patients over 60 may harbor a benign growth, often of the adrenal gland, which is detected when diagnostic imaging is used for the analysis of unrelated symptoms. With the increased use of uh, whole body scanning as part of uh, health screening programs, the chance of finding incidental lomas is expected to increase, okay? Now, the truth is we are not doing whole body screening anymore. We did it for a while, and I think it fell apart because some people could not read a study as normal. At Hopkins, we had probably 3% positive. Some places had 70% positive. Well, 70% of all the people walking around who are quote unquote fine, the wealthy, healthy, concerned, there's no chance they have 70% positive. So you can see the system broke down. But nevertheless, incidental findings become very important. We really need to know how to do deal with them, and that's what we're going to speak about. And there was an article in the New York Times more than a decade ago, but that article has been repeated many times. The incidental loma problem with medical scans. CT scans often turn up incidental problems that are better left untreated. So that's what we're dealing with. So what's the issue with incidental omas? Well, scan protocols are often not designed to evaluate the discovered finding. So for example, you have one phase through the adrenal, and is that a lipid poor adenoma, or is it something else? You may not know because you only have one phase and you can't look at a phase, let's say a non-contrast scan, and the adrenal is 31, and it's two centimeters in size, and say what it is. If you had multiple phases, you could prove it's an adenoma, or maybe it's a pheochromocytoma. So how do you deal with something where you don't have all the information, and some of the information will be critical? Clinical history is often limited, and past imaging studies are not available. Going back to that adrenal incidental oma, if it was there five years ago, you really wouldn't be worrying about it to the same degree. And also, maybe it's an ER patient, we have right lower quadrant pain, we don't have much history or medical records. This is the challenge of undercalling versus overcalling in clinical practice. It drives the clinicians crazy and the patients. When you say, can't rule out this, can't rule out this, advise clinical correlation, advise this, that doesn't work. Improved CT scan quality increases the frequency of incidental findings. And what I mean by that is in the old days when you had thick sections and scans were slow, a tumor was four centimeters. 
Now we pick up pancreatic tumors under a sonometer. But when you have better quality scans, you can pick up other subtle findings. And the question at times is, is that subtle finding a clinically important finding or something not? So the better the scans, the good news is the more tumors you're going to pick up earlier, but also the potential for more incidental omas. And the push for early diagnosis can lead to overcalling pathology or suspected pathology. I think one challenge we all face is nobody wants to miss something. No one ever got yelled at, or maybe no one hardly got yelled at, when you say pancreas probably normal, but wonder about some textural changes in the body, recommend MRCP or recommend EUS. Again, when you recommend another study, it seems like you've took the onus off the study you have just been reading. Now, when you look at the future, incidental omas are really going to prove even more important. And what I mean by that is one of the biggest things in early cancer detection is the so-called liquid biopsy. Now, what liquid biopsy does is pick up the presence of malignancy when the cells are in the thousands, not in the billions. Now, it works very well for certain organs, and the work is still going on. There are companies like Grail out of California, or the work Bert Vogelstein and Ken Kinsler have done out of, under uh, the Hopkins umbrella with Thrive. But again, we are going to pick up earlier tumors, then we have to find them. We're going to have to do imaging studies, perhaps PET-CT or contrast-enhanced CT or PET-CT with contrast. We're going to be looking for small tumors. We want to make sure we don't overcall those tumors. In this article in Science, this is the work from Thrive looking at 10,000 plus patients at Geisinger using PET-CT as a way of evaluating those patients with a positive liquid biopsy. This detect a blood test, as it was called then, now it's called cancer seek. Um, the important thing about it was that you had this positive study, but what did it mean? You can't treat if you can't find the lesion, and how do you find? We use PET-CT as a way of getting a single exam to quickly help with triaging of the patients, and that seemed to work very, very well. In that same article, um, Lennon makes the point, of course, that we know cancer treatments are often more successful when the disease is detected early. We value the feasibility and safety of multi-cancer blood testing coupled with PET-CT imaging to detect cancer in a prospective interventional study of 10,006 women not previously known to have cancer. Now, work is going on. There's a new study, I think over 100,000 patients starting soon, not only women, but men. So we'll see where this liquid biopsy goes. I think there's no doubt it's going to be valuable. The question is how valuable, how accurate. They're working on it being not just positive, but positive for stomach or positive for spleen or liver, whatever. So this is going to be a very important part of the work of radiologists in the future and surely may drive the use of PET-CT. We'll see. By the way, when you look at that study that was done, that article by Lennon, you can see where the tumors were, thyroid, esophagus, lung, liver, a number of colorectal, appendix, uterine, ovary. So again, not every patient who had a positive test had a finding. You can see 101 participants um, without cancer, 22 with. So you can see one out of five or so had cancer, but that's pretty good for a screening test where there was no pre-test prediction of the patient having tumor. So again, here's another chart from that detect study giving you an idea of where we're going to be looking. But again, when you're looking at a positive test, when you're looking for a positive cancer seek type test, you're going to be thinking the patient must have a tumor. Is the radiologist going to overcall the report? Are they going to call every subtle finding, cannot exclude, cannot rule out? It's going to be interesting how things indeed work out. Now, one of the things we notice when you talk about incidental omas, um, it's one of the things that becomes very important, and now the ACR has really did a lot of work on this, is that everybody looks at incidental omas 
and reports them the same way. If not, the referring clinicians go crazy. Everyone needs to report an incidental two sodometer adrenal lesion that measures 33 Hounsfield units exactly the same way, asking for a contrast study to look for washout value or looking to see maybe it's a pheochromocytoma, but something will need to be done. Now, when we wrote this article more than a decade ago, we took 12 common incidental CT findings from thyroid nodules to lung nodules to coronary artery calcification to cystic pancreatic lesions to incidental liver lesion, renal lesions, splenic lesions, and the like. We really covered multiple organ systems. And we just asked a simple question, what would you do if you had this finding? Well, you can see that 70% or greater agreement was only identified in six of the 12 findings, while in other ones, there wasn't 70% agreement. Now you want 100% agreement, but 70 seemed to be better than nothing. And so thyroid nodule, ultrasound for 3CM cyst and postmenopausal women, Fleischner Society, which has done a great job for lung nodules, everybody follows that, coronary calcification, small bowel intersusception, jejunum, and a splenic cyst. And what we found was we had three departments answer the questions, Hopkins, NYU, and Stanford, and not only was there disagreement within departments, as well as across institutions. And we came to the conclusion that it would be important to have guidelines to create a strong recommendation of what's needed to be done. Cole and Feister wrote an article that said, with the high false positive rate of incidentalomas and the very low rates of malignancies among incidentalomas, they wondered if you needed informed consent when a patient got a CT or any imaging study to say, hey, we may find something that ends up not being real, but it may take a lot of effort on your part to work it up. Okay, so no one has done that, but it was their way of saying that incidental lomas can be problematic. Now, I guess the question is, how often do you expect to see an incidental finding of note? Now, I will have to admit, it will vary on the person. Show the same scans to five different people, and you're going to have five different responses. Some people do not overcall. They may tend to undercall, but let things go by. Some people have never read a normal scan, so things will vary. In trying to figure out what we could realistically expect, trying to get numbers, I went back to the era of whole body scanning and this article by Brad Zawaski, he said that almost one third of the patients had abnormal scans. Now a lot of these, 43% were lung nodules, but one third of patients had important findings, including 19 cancers, aneurysms, gallstones, and ovarian cystic lesions. In this article by Nadu, Looking at patients undergoing CTA of the abdomen and lower extremities, 15% had previously undiagnosed highly important findings, making the point that even on a runoff study, you better look carefully at the other organs. Now, it would not be surprised that patients who are getting aorta and runoff studies would have a high incidence of incidental findings because these patients tend to be older, and one would assume that patients who are older have a higher chance of incidental malignancies. Highly important extravascular findings were found in 15% of patients. Uh, the most important were lesions of the kidney, lung, and liver. So again, a good number. In this article by Song, uh, incidentally clinically important extra urinary findings at CT in patients evaluated for hematuria. Now, one of the most important incidental findings is a renal mass, but in this article, that was the reason for the study. So that didn't count. So if you left the kidneys off, 6.8% of patients had clinically important or potentially important incidental findings requiring further investigation. So you can see that was the number, 6.8%. In this article by Staub, looking at patients who are undergoing endovascular stent placement, it was 17.1%. Again, 
Early on, the average age of patients getting TAVRs were over 80, surely for a long time, even over 70. Again, no surprise, incidental findings in older patients are more apt to be critical. Incidental findings in younger patients are more apt not to be critical. In this article by Staub, 60 of 204, 29%, uh, no non-cardiac findings were observed. Of the remaining 144 exams, or 70%, 35 of 204 had a total of 37 clinically significant non-cardiac findings, including eight malignancies, okay? So again, malignancies, pleural effusions, diverticulitis, a range of possibilities. Again, it's very important to recognize from this article that you are going to see, again, 17.1% in this population. And again, here's the list. I won't go through it, but again, you can see what we're dealing with. Another article, this article by uh, James, looking at incidental findings in blunt trauma patients. Now, most of the time, blunt trauma patients are younger. So you should see a less frequent set of findings. So follow-up was required for 3% of incidental findings and admission immediate intervention was required in under 1%. So you could see that depending on the patient's age, which will often be related to specifically why they're getting the study. Obviously, trauma patients are typically younger, particularly MVAs, and TAVR patients are typically older. So it becomes very, very important. In this article by Kumada, looking again at trauma patients for incidental findings, whole body CT revealed incidental findings in 40% of trauma patients. Now, in their series, the mean age of the patients with incidental findings was 62.8 plus or minus 19, and the mean injury severity score was 16.6 plus or minus 10. No difference was observed in the severity of trauma, age, or length of hospital stay. The incidental findings were related to liver, gallbladder, kidneys, lung, and intracranial. The recognition rate of incidental findings after the implementation of the feedback system increased from 23 to 32%. So in this series with trauma, they had a whole lot of things, a whole lot of incidental findings. So let me try to summarize then. What helps to find the frequency of incidental findings? The area scanned. You scan the lungs, you're going to see a lot of lung nodules. The reason for doing this study, TAVR patients are older, higher incidence of significant findings. The protocol, if you don't use IV contrast, you don't use oral, you're not going to see much of anything. So perhaps you're not going to pick up a lot of incidental findings. Or on the other hand, you're going to overcall lots of things that you could have recognized with IV contrast. The age of the patient is critical. The younger the patient, the least likely you have incidental findings, and those that are found are not significant. And then who is reading the study? As I mentioned, some people have never read a normal study. So now we get back to the problem. Incidental omas. What is the significance? Do we need to do another study? Do we need a biopsy? Do we need surgery? What do you tell the patient? Who pays for these additional studies? All of these are very important questions. And again, I don't want to make it seem like incidental findings are not important. Yes, a lot of them are benign lesions, but they can be renal cells and aortic aneurysms and lung cancers, PE, especially in oncology patients, and cystic pancreatic lesions like IPMNs that may need to be followed for the next nine years. So we really need to look at it very carefully. And this problem of incidental findings is perhaps even greater in the ER because the protocols are often limited. The clinical history is often limited. It may be the first time you're seeing the patient, so there's no comparison films. So there are many challenges in the ER setting. But again, we have these challenges in all patients that we see. So let's look at some examples. But I know we're kind of out of time for this first talk, so let's stop here and let's pick it up with looking at some specific findings that I think are incidental omas, 
but I think how you work through them becomes important to not create more problems. And let's come back in a few minutes and discuss that. And I got to get some water because I'm thirsty. See you in a few minutes. Bye. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.